Hello, good afternoon. <laughs> My name is David Luchne. I'm uh, happy to welcome you at this installment of uh, the seminar series of the Institute of Geology and Paleontology. Today, our uh, guest is Dr. Daniel Garcia Castellanos uh, from the <laughs> Uh, from uh, Geosciences Barcelona, uh, which is a part of uh, the Spanish Research Council, uh, Consejo Superior de Investigaciones uh, Científicas, which is uh, an institution similar to the uh, Czech Academy of Sciences uh, to some extent or to a large extent. Uh, Daniel is uh, presently uh, a guest of uh, the Institute of Geophysics of the Academy. Uh, where he is hosted by our new group or uh, a new team of uh, surface processes led by John Janssen, who, who also who actually has invited John, uh, sorry, Daniel, to, uh, to jo join us for uh, several months. And um, today the, uh, the seminar was advertised as uh, uh, one devoted to um, both uh, or, or one, one suitable for both students of soft rock, sedimentology and stratigraphy and uh, paleontology and earth history, because I believe the, the topic will be uh, very interesting for uh, all of you, for people from different disciplines. But before that, before we start, let me just quickly uh, uh, give you a bit of background about uh, Daniel. Uh, he has... Uh, uh, defended his PhD in 1998 uh, in physics in Barcelona, and uh, after afterwards he uh, went on to uh, for a postdoc uh, research in uh, the Netherlands in uh, Utrecht, was it, <clears throat> for five years? And since then he has uh, uh, been uh, he has done most of his research in Barcelona at uh, the uh, at, at, uh, at the same institute. Uh, his uh, attitude to uh, earth sciences, to various problems of geodynamics, has always been uh, deeply rooted in quantitative approaches and numerical modeling, uh, starting with his PhD and con uh, continuing ever since. And uh, the, the range of problems that he has dealt with is, is quite enormous uh, from, from uh, modeling basins forming in response to uh, lithospheric flexure through um, uh, geomorphology uh, of, uh, of subduction zones, uh, more recently uh, dealing with dynamics of lake overflow and spilling. Uh, he has uh, been greatly interested in, uh, in the interplay between the deeper seated lithospheric processes and what is going on on the surface and the mutual uh, interaction of uh, surface processes and the uh, lithospheric scale processes. And uh, uh, today uh, you will uh, see an example of, of this approach uh, in <clears throat> on a topic that Daniel has been involved with for a fairly long time, which is the Messinian salinity crisis, the Zanklian flood. And uh, I hope, uh, or I'm sure you will enjoy it. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you for this course. Very good summary, better than I would probably. Um, well, um, I, I must start saying thank you, you all. I already said it the other time for, for hosting me here. I'm really having a great time. I'm, I feel like a honor and a pleasure to be interacting with so many interesting people both in the geophysics department and the university housing. Um, as said, this is going to be my, my second presentation and uh, this uh, related to this uh, stay here in Prague. And uh, this time I will deal with an issue that is a really, really unique event in in Earth history, it's it's actually um, um, an event that uh, uh, it's it's probably the most um, abrupt and intense 
in terms of energy dissipated the last uh, 65 minutes eighty boundary. Therefore, is a, a event that tests the um, it tests the, the ability of the Earth to to resilience to uh, changes in the boundary conditions. I think this should be of big interest in future research how the Earth responds to to changing environment. Um, okay, this has been on its own, but um, uh, what happened is that about uh, six million years ago, something went on in the Mediterranean, at the entire Mediterranean scale, and transformed that sea into a huge salt pan, uh, where a kilometer thick layer of uh, halite was deposited in the bottom, and uh, for a long time what you would uh, see as uh, the sedimentary record is what you see images here, purely halite and uh, gypsum in many areas. Of Let me show you that. This is the blocks falling from the first cycle of gypsum precipitation about six million years ago in southern Spain. Uh, everything that you see in this picture is actually pure crystal, translucent crystals of pure gypsum, including the house itself. It's built with the same rock. So um, this um, is how they look like. They have several types of crystallization patterns, but usually they show this branchiated type of crystallization. The locals, they call these palm trees. And uh, this, actually, you, there is a cave, Torbas, in this area I'm showing you, where you can act, walk underneath, you can walk underneath these first cycles, one of the cycles, and you can see how the nucleation of these palm trees, of these first gypsum branching trees, start nucleating. That's that's about gypsum, but where is the halite? Halite is also, it's only present in areas that have been pushed up by tectonic deformation. That's Sicily. This is a mine, old mine in, in uh, Sicily, near La Clea Minoa. It contains some potash, that's what brings these nice colors to uh, the, the layers. But mostly it resembles like you can see here. It resembles uh, white pure. It's okay. It's working. Okay, so um, in, the, in that mine you can see things like these yearly cycles of about 15 centimeters in thickness, which already tells you about. Uh, that the, um, the hydrological budget of the entire Mediterranean was similar to today's, because 15 centimeters of halite is, is about what you would precipitate from a saturated brine in, uh, with the present day climatic uh, situation in the Mediterranean. Every year the Mediterranean is losing about one meter of water if it would be not supplied from the Atlantic or from, from the rivers. Um, yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are not. Yeah, it's not your eyes. Yeah, yeah. The miners they excavate these uh, uh, figures in the and the virgins and all the stuff in the, into the. Uh, so so it's okay. It's not your. It's not you. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, as I said, this, this you can see only in places like Sicily and, and, and Cyprus, where the tectonics have been pushing up all this, because uh, halite is precipitating later than gypsum during the evaporation of seawater, so it's concentrated more in the central parts and the deeper parts of the Mediterranean basins. All these that I have shown, this was already known by these guys, uh, Karl Mayer, he was the one who was defining the Messinian stage, and uh, he was based on this recognition that at a similar uh, period of time there were, this, uh, there were these outcrops all over the Mediterranean showing about evaporitic conditions. 
And Raimundo Selly was the one who was defining the Mercedes salinity crisis concept. And uh, they knew, he already knew about this because uh, in his times, um, there were this proliferation of uh, seismic surveys, um, making, producing, providing cross sections of, of the underground uh, uh, across the sea and showing this layer of relatively transparent fascias that is uh, related to um, halide. And halide behaves as a um, viscous fluid over geological time scales, and that's why it produces this diapir. So it was easy to recognize that there was this, uh, this, I know this uh, um, halide layer that you can see in Sicily. It was also present in the depth of the, of the sea. So slowly with uh, the proliferation of these uh, seismic techniques, uh, a map uh, has been developed where you can uh, see that halite is concentrated in the center of the basins, whereas gypsum is more in the, in the outer parts. Uh, today, this is a recent paper with, where, that is compiling all these uh, available seismic surveys, and this gives a very accurate vision of what is the distribution of these uh, Messinian deposits. As I said, uh, well, the scale is in meters, so uh, in some places you can find deposits that reach nearly uh, four kilometers, especially in areas where uh, subduction is squeezing this salt and is accumulating, piling up the salt uh, near the, the subduction trenches. Um, so uh, the, the overall stratigraphy that has been inferred out of all these uh, surveys is different for the Eastern and the Western Mediterranean. In the Western Mediterranean, you have this trilogy where you have halite uh, covered by post, halite post uh, salt deposits. And this is, these have been drilled and they show that they, they are reworked uh, gypsum from the margins. So it seems like Gypsum was exposed in the margins and then delivered and redeposited on top of the halide. So this means that after the initiation of halide precipitation, the seafloor or at least the margins were exposed and uh, to, to the effects of erosion. Uh, the thing is different in the in the eastern basin. There you you have only uh, halide, and the, there is. Uh, clear uh, erosion surfaces on top, on the bottom and the top of, of that layer. Okay, those, uh, all this was, as I said, vaguely known in the, in the 60s. And then it's at, by the late 60s when these three guys, uh, Bill Ryan, uh, um, Kenneth Sue and Maria Bianca Chica, they made this proposal to drill for the first time in C2, this deep basin halide. And they, they were very recognized for that because they found uh, very uh, exciting things, like, uh, for instance, anhydride that is supposed to form normally only at high temp temperatures exposed uh, under uh, in subaerial conditions. But these, this sample here and this sample here were, are found in a drilling uh, more than two kilometers deep today. So um, this needs an explanation because it's an area that, that hasn't been deformed tectonically, so you cannot explain that it's down there because of tectonic uh, reasons. And therefore, this crack, this apparent crack in the salt uh, core uh, extracted from this drilling uh, suggests that this halide, this salt pan, was exposed to the air. So that would... Uh, Im uh, imply, and this is how this, the authors uh, uh, interpreted this, that this was exposed to uh, subaerial conditions at high temperature. Okay, so um, slowly uh, the, the consensus about what is the uh, stratigraphy of the basin is, is not easy. And le but let's say that the overall view I extracted from this recent paper related to our uh, ETM project, Salt Giant. The uh, overall view is that the primary lower gypsum is the first thing that happened in the margins. And then after that, uh, you have reworked deposits 
falling into the deeper parts of the of the basins. Then comes the halite, probably coeval with the drawdown, and you see some discontinuities, some discordances in within the, the the these different layers. And then the upper gypsum comes, and the upper gypsum uh, it's uh, interpreted as re sedimented or diluted from the margins from the primary gypsum deposited initially this one here in the margins and transported to the deeper parts of the basin and redeposited there okay that that's about uh, evidence for um, recording the Mycenaean salinity crisis i will now continue to uh, two more types of evidence erosion and big and biological impact and then I will move into what are the mechanisms that are responsible for all this. Well, I, um, about the erosion, uh, this map is showing uh, one of the uh, features that are common, commonly studied related to the Messinian sea level drawdown in the Mediterranean, which are these uh, valleys excavated during the lowering of the sea level. Because of the lowering of the base level of the Mediterranean, streams propagate upstream an erosional wave that uh, according to these authors it propagates further upstream that's in the vertical axis uh, depending on the area and the drainage area of those rivers okay so that is a first hint that there was actually a significant lowering of the of the base level that was first seen in the uh, nile delta these are very old papers uh, that were the first to, uh, to, to, to turn on this light about the, the, the uh, incision um, in response to sea level drawdown. But I will, let me show you, this is more recent. This is in the uh, margin of uh, Libya. Uh, and here we are looking at a valley that is about um, uh, 200 kilometers upstream from the coast. And uh, this is the Gulf of Sirt. And uh, it reaches a depth of uh, more than 500 to 750 meters near the coastline. So it's a very deep feature that you cannot explain by uh, climatic oscillations during the Playa Quaternary, uh, by sea level fluctuations, I mean. This, this is not uh, eustatic. There must be another explanation. Um, this is an area. Sorry, aerial picture of the of the area today. So all this is presently covered in sand. This is the result of um, of prospection. Another, my favorite example is this one in the Ebro Delta. So here we are in the um, coast of uh, Spain, and uh, this is uh, the uh, the delta formed by the Ebro. And this three D block seismic uh, performed in three dimensions. Uh, from there, you can extract automatically the Messinian discontinuity, the discordance during the Messinian, the Messinian erosion surface. That's the name we use for it. And based on that and the coherence, you can actually perform on this data um, river geomorphology. You can see the meanders recorded, registered in this surface that you extract from this uh, 3D seismic block. And you can actually see river terraces. That would be otherwise very difficult to explain if it would not be subaerial transport. But because an alternative explanation that is uh, sometimes cited for, for these features is that it could be produced by submarine canyons. But examples like this really uh, make it very difficult to envisage such origin for, for these features. Uh, so this is part of uh, the thesis by Haneke Haida. Uh, she will soon be ready with it. Uh, what we do is we compile at the scale of the entire, this is uh, Corsica and Sardinia, the Balearic Islands here, and the Ebro Delta I was mentioning before here. And we, what we do is we compile all these features that could represent coastlines, re recorders of, of the past location of, of the coastlines. Uh, the problem is what you pick as a, as a, a sign for coastline. You can choose either the extent of halite, the lateral extent of halite, how far does it reach from the deeper parts to, into the margins, 
or you can choose the distribution, the extent, the lateral extent of uh, the upper deposits. And depending on that, you get different estimations of what was, by doing a, a flexural backstripping of those shoreline indicators, of what was the original depth of, the, of this sea level drawdown. How much did the, the sea level went down during the desiccation of the Messina and Salinity crisis? As for the biological impact, um, um, I will show this, uh, these three. Um, first, this, uh, the, this gap in the plant diversification um, uh, that star starts exactly uh, around five to six million years ago, and that has an impact on the di diversification of plants in, uh, around the Mediterranean that lasts until the beginning of the uh, Mediterranean climate, the formation of the present day uh, Mediterranean climate. So that's one example. Another is the impact that this had on the dispersal of mammals from Africa to Iberia, and as I show in this picture, from Iberia to the Balearic Islands, for, for example. So suddenly, new species arrive there. Uh, this is not a conclusive argument favoring or ensuring that there was actually an exposure of the seafloor, because such uh, mammal dispersal sometimes occur even if you don't have a direct connection. Like uh, one happened before the Messinan event, uh, similar dispersal that there is no way to invoke a desiccation of the Mediterranean Sea at that time. So we have to take this with caution, but it still is an argument. And then you have the um, impact on the marine life, and there things are more impressive. Of course, during the Messinian Salinity crisis, the uh, fauna in the uh, in the in the, in the, mar in the marine waters in the, in the in the isolated waters of the Mediterranean practically vanishes, so it disappears, it goes to zero. But even before that, there is already a signature that is presently being studied by Konstantin uh, Achiadi. This is work in progress. And um, this is a very uh, a, a project that gives a lot of hope because it seems that it will be able to quantify in a very precise way what was the impact of this, uh, of this isolation, progressive isolation during the Messinian period before the crisis uh, and how soon this process of differentiation or, or, or the effects of uh, increasing salinity started in the having an effect on, on life. And uh, presumably that's uh, also responsible, the crisis is itself responsible for the present pattern of uh, lateral or, or east to west gradient in spe species richness that you see today in, um, in the Mediterranean. This is a, a fact that has been recently recognized. As I just realized that this paper here has uh, 1,700 citations. I saw it yesterday, checking the... So it, all, understanding where all this comes from is very important. And I think the, the, the Messina Sanity crisis had uh, clearly a role in starting all this. Um, there are many open questions about the Messinian, but I don't have time to go through all of them. Uh, I will concentrate on the last one, as I said, what is the mechanisms, what are the mechanisms uh, related, um, that responsible for this isolation uh, of the Mediterranean and the later restoration of normal marine, marine conditions, because everything ends pretty sharply. All right, so, about the mechanisms. What could cause this isolation? Clearly, um, the Mediterranean is a high salinity um, sea today, uh, but this salinity is not enough, is not, not even close to uh, precipitation of any, any, any salt contained in the sea. In order to isolate the Mediterranean, you need to narrow the uh, Strait of Gibraltar, if you had the same configuration as today. You need to narrow it in order to until you block enough the outflow, the outflow of the dense high salinity waters that go into the, um, into the Atlantic. That's the important thing, more than the inflow. You can, you can have a salt pan, you can accumulate as much salt as you need in a basin by just blocking not the inflow, but the out outflow, because that is what uh, allows you to accumulate 
um, uh, salt in your isolated basin. And to um, block the outflow, what you need, first of all, you need an evaporitic condition in, the, in your basin. So the Mediterranean is evaporating more than it receives from the rivers. And this, um, this ensures that the inflows are larger than the outflows. So as you reduce the size of this, then eventually you will only have space for the inflows to come in. And there, that's when the saturation or the increase, increasing salinity starts in the, in the, in the sea. Um, I think. I, oh, yes, this is an animation of... Sorry for the music. Um, this is, has been done by the University of Malaga. This is showing this interplay between the outflow in the Mediterranean and the inflow. Um, and what you see is that at each tide, tidal cycle in the Atlantic Ocean, it will spill fresh water or relatively fresh marine, normal marine water into the uh, uh, Mediterranean, whereas the outflow is trying to escape. And you see that at each tide in this configuration, at each tide, the, this spilling of water caused by the high tide in the Atlantic side is impeding the outflowing waters, the deeper, denser, more concentrated waters from the, from the Mediterranean to get out of the sea. Okay, you can see the interaction of these, um, of these uh, two layers of water in the surface, in satellite images, and if you are lucky enough, you can even see it from, from the Strait of Gibraltar it, itself. Now, what cost? So, you, we need something that closes the, uh, the gateways, the last gateway between the Atlantic and the, the Mediterranean. What could it be? Well, the easiest option is uh, a geodynamic event or a tectonic uh, uh, phenomenon. The tectonic uh, uh, context in the area is that uh, the Tethys Ocean is progressively isolated after the breakup of Pangaea, eventually leading to uh, something uh, progressively more isolated uh, from, from the rest of the, of the oceans. That leads to this situation about 12 million years that I show here, where you have uh, the, these remnants of the Tethys Ocean are uh, separated now into two realms, which is the, neo, the Tethys and Neo-Tethys area, or well, the present Mediterranean, let's say, and the Paratethys, what is called the Paratethys Sea, that is intracontinental isolated basin with a completely different fauna. And uh, as uh, Africa and Europe continue approaching each other, then what happens is that their last connections in the Strait of Gibraltar and here they close completely and then you get this hypersaline um, uh, condition in the, in the Mediterranean basin. All right, and if you do the numbers, um, uh, the funny thing is that uh, we know, as I said, we, we know how much mass of halite has been uh, uh, deposited in the Mediterranean Sea. And if you do the numbers, you can estimate that actually you would need to evaporate about 14 to 22 times the volume of the Mediterranean in order to accumulate that amount of salt. So it's not just simply closing the gateway and uh, uh, letting the Mediterranean dry, but something has, must, uh, must have uh, lasted for quite long in order to isolate that outflow for time enough to accumulate this amount of, uh, of, of halide. So, it's, so we need something else. We need something that keeps the inflow open, but the outflow closed. And all that, in addition to the eustatic sea level curves, that should add some noise to that. What could that be? The explanation we were exploring is um, about the role of erosion along seaways. And so what we did is a 0D model. It's a very simple model that accounts for evaporation in the Mediterranean Sea and the erosion produced by the water flow uh, entering the Mediterranean Sea. And for that, we use 
a very simple uh, approach. We um, estimate the erosion as a proportional uh, power law of the stress, basal shear stress. And basal shear stress is related to the sea level difference between Mediterranean and uh, Atlantic. So the more sea level difference, the more erosion. And the more um, um, that's, that's reflected in this S here, which represents the slope of the spillway into the, into the Mediterranean. And another key parameter, of course, is also the um, erodability, this K here. So this erosion is erodability times shear stress. And putting that together uh, in a model, this, uh, and I sh I'm showing here time in the horizontal axis and uh, elevation in, in the vertical axis. Um, if you force a constant rate uplift, this will eventually re uh, li lift the seal until it gets closer, close to the Atlantic level. And then it will, the, the sea level in the red line will go down because it does not it is not receiving enough water from the Atlantic because the seal is too shallow. Okay, so eventually evaporation will produce a drawdown of the Mediterranean level, and this drawdown will increase the erosion capacity of this inflowing water. So eventually the two things, the, the forced uplift, the prescribed uplift of the seal, and the sea level of the Mediterranean will find an equilibrium with one another, and that is what we propose might be keeping this inflow of water uh, open, allowing salt to come in and accumulate in the Mediterranean for some period of time before, before the full closure takes place. So this would be a, um, an, an animation of this phenomenon. This is the, the seal being pushed up by, by tectonic forces, right? And every time the, the seal manages to close the, the inflow of water, then the Mediterranean goes down and, and vice versa, right? And out of this competition, you get accumulation of as, many, as much salt as you need in the Mediterranean Sea. Now, what could cause these rates of uplift? And then, for, to tackle this, we were uh, going to um, tomographic data, as you can see here. Uh, this is a, a moving section. First, you can see the location map here. So what it is showing is a slab that is uh, lithospheric slab that is attached to Iberia. Iberia would be in the left here. And it's attached to Iberia in, in the western part, but is detached in the eastern part. I'm going to show it easier probably here. This is a geological map uh, puzzle with, uh, with, the, with the same tomographic uh, image. In blue, you have high speed seismic velocities, and this is for six, 660 kilometers deep. So this goes deep into the, into the mantle. And uh, what you see is that there is a point, at what we call the tearing point, that separates and the, the area where the, this lithospheric slab is hanging from uh, southern Iberia, from the area farther to the east, in the right side, where the, the same slab seems to be detached. And the idea does, is that this detachment of a dense body of, um, of a lithospheric slab that is detached in the eastern side, this is, would be the cause for this uplift of the internal sedimentary basins in that are uh, isolated in the Betics. The arrows are showing when the age in million years of these basins and how much did they move up. They moved up by several hundreds of meters in cases. So we think that detachment, the steering of a lithospheric slab could be the, the reason why, uh, why that was closing one of these uh, last connections between the two oceans. Um, uh, then we did some 3D geodynamic modeling to, to uh, test this uh, hypothesis. And what you see here is uh, one of these uh, slabs after a continental collision where uh, it starts under certain conditions that I don't have time to, to explain, but under certain conditions you can trigger a lateral tearing 
of this subducted lithospheric slab. And what you see in the colors is the vertical velocity of this, of this slab. The red is showing the fastest down going uh, speed. And this speed uh, is very negative, so it's down going uh, in, the, in the beginning. And you see the interesting thing is that at the same time that the slab is sinking, you get some areas uh, in where the slab is still attached to the upper plate, where the, instead of um, uh, the, 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 this connection to the upper plate is also pulling down the, um, the upper plate, where, where it is still attached to Iberia. So why is this important? Because this means that at the same time that you have uplift in the uh, areas where it has been detached, you have some sinking in the areas where the slab is still attached to the upper plate. Okay, well, please, let me skip this. But the interpretation of all this uh, is essentially what you see in this cartoon. Uh, the tearing, the lateral tearing, would explain uplift along one part of the orogen that is on top of that, that would be the Betic Riffian for the era in um, southern Spain and northern um, Morocco. And uh, by the same process, because all the weight of this uh, high-density subducted lithosphere is now hanging only from the left side, then you get subsidence there. Okay, so the, say, the idea is that the slab tearing might be responsible for the uplift of the, of the basins, and at the same time you are downlifting uh, uh, the area of the Strait of Gibraltar, and that would allow the later overtopping of waters, of Atlantic waters, that you need to explain why the Mediterranean is refilled. Um, well, this is a, a, an outreach video. We uh, produced some uh, years ago already, that is explaining essentially the same story, uh, this detachment of the of a piece of lithospheric slab. This, this was for diffusion in, in media and webs, websites. Well, the, so that the closure of the connection has, is leading to the evaporative drawdown of the, of the entire city. Okay, now, how to refill the Mediterranean? I already gave a hint. Once you have the basin desiccated, you need something that brings some part of the divide between the Atlantic and the Mediterranean again down below uh, the Atlantic sea level. And that's, that's not trivial because you just uplifted it. That's why that mechanism about uh, the lithospheric slab tearing is important because that one can produce simultaneously uplift and subsidence, which is uh, otherwise would be difficult to, to explain. The fact is that the transition from the, all this Mycenaean uh, record, the sedimentary record, to the Zanclean stage, um, it's very abrupt. So if you go to the original papers, where these IODP drillings are described, uh, sometimes you can put the finger on it, and sometimes it's only just a few centimeters. So something that geologically it's just instantaneous. And, um, and but this is not enough as to because instantaneous in geology can mean tens of thousands of years, and you would not realize in the record, right? But there are other indications that uh, suggest that this refilling was not at a normal, geologically speaking, rate, but it was something unprecedentedly um, uh, abrupt and, and rapid. The first one is the, these uh, erosion marks across that cross the Strait of Gibraltar. Normally, you would have this Messinian erosion surface all over the Mediterranean, and that's, and that's not needing additional explanation apart from exposure. But the problem is that here in the Strait of Gibraltar, this erosion uh, pattern is actually crossing the drainage divide of the uh, Gibraltar Strait itself, which is already weird from a geomorphological point of view. No? 
You need something that is capable of eroding beyond into the Atlantic Ocean. And it enters by more than 80 kilometers in place. Um, I'm not showing this seismic lens, but this would be a um, compilation of the, uh, this Messinian erosion surface over the entire Alboran Sea. So this, this is Spain here, or Iberian Peninsula, and Morocco. And this would be one of the uh, uh, seismic survey across uh, this position about this position. So this is the typical configuration of this erosion channel that we describe along the Alboran Sea. It's a, it's, a, it's a trough, an erosive trough, about 400 kilometers long, 2 to 10 kilometers wide, and several hundred meters deep. And altogether it makes more than a thousand kilo, cubic kilometers of erosion. And this is what we proposed already years ago. I, I'm not showing those old results, but uh, this is what we propose as the place through which the refilling of the Mediterranean occurred. And um, the thing is that to explain the, the size of this, then there is no way that you can ex explain that without a very rapid uh, refill in less than a few years of the entire Mediterranean Sea. And that implies um, water discharges that exceed um, or, or approach to 100 Sverdrups, which is 100 uh, million cubic meters per second. Okay, and so it, it's really a, a big thing that needs big evidence to be supported. The, the first evidence is this one, is what you see here, is this uh, erosion trough that, as I say, crosses the, the Gibraltar Strait. But then we were looking for, more recently, we were looking for additional evidence that could test this independently. And the, the common uh, invocation is what happened to all, that, all this sediment that I was just mentioning. If all this was eroded from the Alboran Sea, all these 1,000 cubic, uh, cubic kilometers of erosion should be found somewhere else. So this is what we attempted to, to look at uh, by first by doing uh, modeling and um, uh, using seismic profiles also in the Alboran Sea and the Ionian Sea and uh, numerical modeling of uh, water flow and transport of material. So first let me show these models where um, we were experimenting by dropping uh, particles of different sizes in an empty Mediterranean. This is again the uh, Alboran Sea and we are dropping um, uh, grain sizes in the order of uh, pebbles to cobble to cobble to um, um, uh, I, I can't see it anymore okay. so, but this is changing uh, the biggest size are the uh, are the green and then they, then it reduces until um, uh, until the blue colors and what we expect of course is that uh, as we expect the the smaller the grain size, the farther they can travel with the water turbulence uh, driven by, by this, um, by this in, inflowing waters into a, a lower Mediterranean sea level. And of course, with sands, then these particles travel much longer and they can go into the main, into the Tyrrhenian Sea, or they can uh, even reach the, the Sicily coast. And another set of experiments we were, we were trying is uh, focused on what happens. That, that's the other frequent question, let's say, about this uh, Zanclean flood hypothesis, is what happens between the East and the West Mediterranean? Because you have a, a threshold there. So if the West Mediterranean is refilling very rapidly, at some point the waters must overtop into the Eastern Mediterranean. And this is what we were also testing by first identifying this uh, very uh, peculiar bo body of sediment with this uh, distribution that you can see uh, here. Um, the characteristics of this sedimentary body is that it's made out of very transparent facies, sorry, it's uh, unit two, very transparent facies, which points to a very non-sorted chaotic body 
that is often seen as a sign for um, very rapid uh, accumulation of, uh, of sediment. Because there is no layering, there is no uh, organization in, in those deposits. Um, one of our plans, well, this you can see more details in this uh, publication, but uh, we were trying to uh, obtain the possibility of drilling these deposits, but unfortunately it has not been successful yet using the Joides Resolution IODP uh, facility. And so we keep on doing modeling because that's uh, more suitable. And uh, in these experiments, what we are doing is we are modeling the uh, ex uh, extent of these uh, low energy areas that may explain the extent of the sedimentary chaotic body that I was showing in the previous figure. And the other interesting feature in the same, in the very same area, I just forget to mention, but we are here. This is Sicily, and this is the Noto Canyon that I will show right now. This is the Noto Canyon. This is a very interesting feature because it, it, it is a very vertical wall with this horseshoe shape that uh, it's underwater today. So this is uh, about, uh, here you have the scale. So I think this is about 2,200 meters below sea level. So uh, this, uh, this doesn't look like something that can be created subaerially normally in its special conditions. And it reminds very much to features like this one belonging to the um, uh, Missoula floods in the uh, Washington state in, in USA. So it's, it's a typical feature of mega flooding, this horseshoe uh, erosion and retreat of erosion during very high uh, flow, uh, flows of very high discharge. In the case of the Missoula flood, we are talking of 10 million cubic meters per second to form that, those features that I just showed. And finally, um, another feature that we have um, found that might be linked to the uh, Zanclian flood is the formation of this type of, um, of deposits in right next to the place here we are in the eastern Alboran Sea. Okay, so again, this is Spain, Africa. And um, in, in this area, there is this volcano building right in the middle of where the flood was meant to go along, just in, right in the middle of the, of the path. And, and right behind, in the lee side of this volcanic edifice, we have this feature that has been um, cross dissected by three uh, seismic cross sections that look like this. So it's an elongated body of a few, uh, of one and a half hundred meters uh, of, uh, of thickness. And we are wondering if this could not be a typical lateral bar deposited uh, along the way of this uh, uh, huge flood that was refilling the Mediterranean. Similar to what we uh, have seen in uh, other outburst uh, mega floods like the one in Altai Mountains. You see this bar here, uh, this, is, this is gravel deposited under suspension conditions. So all this valley was filled with water only a few thousand years ago. And in the areas of low energy, you had the deposits of these lateral bars that are now dissected by a tributary that drains to the main river going here. But this would be a cross section um, of what this uh, looks like. So you have this tilting outwards um, uh, sediments and, um, and uh, suspension deposits that, uh, well, John, John Johnson can explain better how this works because I, I'm not really an expert of this. But this would be the, the, the cool thing to, that would be ideal to identify if we were able to, to drill these deposits one day.
that would be really that was our dream and actually dream was the acronym for our proposal but it doesn't it looks like the dream is is failing so far anyway so the take home messages i want to leave you with um is that uh, soul giants in general they um they, um, they form by the reduction of connectivity of uh, very large basins. Uh, and this connectivity is very much controlled, not just by tectonic processes or by eustatic sea, sea changes, sea level changes, but also by the erodibility of those seaways. So those seaways are important to understand and to constrain because being so large, the Mediterranean, basins like the Mediterranean, they, they need so much inflow water that as soon as there is a little bit of the uh, level difference between the two sides, they will generate high amounts of erosion rate. The Messina Salenti crisis was primarily caused by tectonic uplift along the Gibraltar arc in competition with erosion along the seaway. And a Mediterranean evaporitic drawdown implies large amount of erosion at the seals. So again, let me insist on this idea. If you have tens of meters of difference between two basins, two large oceanic basins, then you will easily exceed what typically the, 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 the vertical motions that you typically obtain from tectonic processes. And if the difference in level becomes larger than hundreds of meters, then any uh, small amount of water that starts trickling from one basin to the other, from the upper to the lower, will uh, easily develop into catastrophic uh, water discharges and the full refilling of the basin. And final one uh, about the, the flood itself. Uh, catastrophic flooding implies a previous large drought in the Mediterranean, for the reason I mentioned before. So um, those two things go linked together. And flood deposits, can validate and refute the flood hypothesis, the mega flood hypothe hypothesis in the Mediterranean. We need to really touch those. We need to drill them. This is what we are aiming at. And uh, because we have at least found these two sets of deposits in the Alboran and the Ionian seas that are comp compatible with uh, typical mega flood deposits. Uh, and uh, that's why we need to independently assess uh, this with drilling. Uh, that's it. I just leave you with another movie. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for a great talk uh, covering some really mind boggling issues in earth science. I believe we now have uh, time for questions, and there will be many. Uh, we will just need to uh, use the microphone for questions. So please give me some time to run to you uh, when, when you raise your hand. Yes, Jan? Yeah, I would like to have uh, two, two questions. Well, sorry, one question, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it, it is basically, if I understood well, uh, the technic uplift uh, had to like undergo two different speeds because the first uh, part of the uplift uh, needed to uh, fill, st like still fill the Mediterranean Sea with uh, salt water from the Atlantic Ocean enoughly to uh, make their so thick deposits of the salt and gypsum and uh, this stuff. And then like uh, the tectonic uplift had to be speeded up to completely close the Gibraltar, if I understood well, right? Just a sec. Yeah, uh, no, no, that's exactly uh, how it is. Either you have some acceleration of the uplift that eventually manages to block fully or to, to um, uh, exceed the effect of the uplift. Sorry, the other way around. So either you have an acceleration of the uplift that eventually exceeds the erosion cap capacity of the inflow waters, but you could also have some minor lithological change because I didn't mention that, but these erodibilities 
they can change in many orders of magnitude from one type rock of rock type to another. But even just the fracturation of the rocks, they can uh, change by a, easily by by orders of magnitude the strength of the rock. So if just by during this uplift, the erosion produced by the inflowing waters reach a weaker, uh, sorry, a harder level, that would already in itself explain uh, the full closure of the of the Mediterranean. Thank you. Uh, we'll just do one little adjustment to the other microphone because we now have a mechanistic explanation of the problem with the mic. <laughs> Uh, Here we go. So I, I don't need to run around like the headless chicken uh, for the next questions. Do we have more? Yeah, okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thanks, Daniel, for, for a great uh, lecture on really complex uh, issues. I'll have a pretty simple question. Um, I believe that you've probably addressed that in some of the papers that that you refer to, but you, you you haven't actually stated that. What's the what was the time scale of the Zanklian flood? You know, how how long did it take uh, for the flood to refill the Mediterranean basin? Yeah, um, yeah. Sorry, I did I didn't mention show more results because it's already ten years old, and I feel a bit ashamed of uh, repeating over and over. But uh, yeah, in that paper, we were um, estimating based on the size of this uh, erosional trough uh, that crosses the Strait of Gibraltar, which is at least 200 meters deep. Then um, the experiments we were doing were um, coupling, in the same way that I was showing, coupling uh, the erosion of the inflowing waters to uh, the refilling and the, the, the enlargement of this uh, seaway that is allowing the, the water to come in. And, and let's say the, the, fi the final situation of this, uh, the final um, uh, time of this model, it must fit the final size, the present size that we see in this erosional trough. And what we found is that there is no way to, to fit that size unless you, you have a very rapid catastrophic like uh, discharge as I said, in the order of 100 million cubic meters per second. And that means that, uh, if I remember the number, 90% of the uh, refill of the Mediterranean took place in less than two years. That was the number we were put given in the paper. And, and truly, the underlying assumption about behind this figure, the important one is, as I said, that these hole that we see today, today is all covered by sediment because there has been 5 million years of sedimentation on top, no? But all this, this erosional trough that we see, if that is was caused by the inflow of water into the Mediterranean, and we see no other way to explain that, then, um, then the, the magnitude must have been uh, in the order of these 100 verdrucks I was mentioning. So two years, it's just a flash. Thanks. Another question there? Okay. Thank you for the presentation. And I have just a well, technical question, not a scientific one, but I will find help for your uh, reconstruction and the videos and GIFs. So I wanted to ask, like, do you do that yourself or do you have, like, people who do this, uh, I don't know, Mm, reconstruction because I think oh. for the science communication is amazing. Ah. No, you no, have no, no, several no. of these, so uh, I, I yes, no, I, no, 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 no. I noticed the um, references, but it's it's really amazing. You, you mean like this one? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, this in in particular was done by the University of Malta. I, I forgot to say, but it, it's written there, and it's associated to one of the to the paper where we describe the um, the, uh, the the, the Features along the Malta escarpment that I was showing. This Noto Canyon with the horseshoe shape that we think might be the result of, of mega flooding. Uh, but not, neither me nor uh, Aaron Mikhaev is, we did anything like that. You know, you just talk to a professional who can do these things. They do it actually very fast nowadays. 
So you have professional like this at your university or not, at the University of Malta? <laughs> not really. No, we don't. We don't. And I don't think Malta University has it either. You just hire someone because there are yeah. many people who is just independent workers that are working on, on this. And that's that's easy because you will need this. I don't know. I, I just made this too, I think, in my life. No. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? John? Thanks, Daniel. Um, I was thinking, I didn't realize that it was such a, a large volume of erosion, actually. So I wonder if, is it possible that the, uh, there was an isostatic response excavation of the trench and deposition of the fan, could that have driven uh, a, a negative feedback to closing off the outlet? Is it enough or is it not the enough? Closure, the, the, the inlet of... Uh, yeah, of so the, the, the gorge yeah. at the strait was cutting, you say, a yeah. couple of hundred meters. Yeah. And inboard was a fan yeah. so was there potentially a kind of tilting effect an isostatic tilting or just no 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 enough? no it makes complete sense uh, actually um there after a few years after our study there was jerry mitrovich uh, you you know him so he so he's working on glacial isostatic processes and and what they were doing because those the timing of this closure of the Mediterranean and the cyclicity that, that we were obtaining during uh, this competition between uh, uplift and erosion along the sealway, uh, along the seal, uh, the, time, the time scales of that are in the order of a few thousand years. And that is comparable to the time scales of glacial static readjustment, as you, as you suggest. So what they were doing is they were coupling to our model, uh, adding on top of it the glacial static response, not exactly to what you say, so not to erosion itself, but uh, to the sea level changes related to this competition. So this, you remember this uh, out of phase um, evolution of the sea depth uh, versus the Mediterranean Sea that I was showing, they were doing, they were coupling the, uh, glacial isostatic response to, to that, to, to see what would be the effect. And they saw a variation in the, in the, in the frequency of these oscillations that would uh, modify the, the values we were obtaining. Significantly, I mean, uh, uh, I don't remember the numbers, but it was more than a 20% or something like that. But that's really not important to, to us because we don't really know we have no observations that allow us to to detect those oscillations in the in the field so far we haven't so what do you say what do you say the role of erosion is more important uh, regarding the reconstruction i was showing these maps of reconstructed paleotopography i was showing by by my student and she is actually having into account the weight of the all the playo quaternary that is deposited on top of this Paleo shoreline markers that we identify to, and she's doing a kind of a back stripping to bring back the, those paleo markers to their original, what should be their original position at the time. Because that, to, to have a more reliable uh, estimation of what was the original sea level in the Mediterranean. So uh, there it is certainly important. And we cannot do it perfectly because. We know the weight of all those sediments, but all those sediments come actually from the continent, and we have no way to know what distribution those sediments have in the rocks in the continent where they come from. And that is also changing the isostatic balance, you see, because but we are just, when going back in time, we are just taking out the Playa Quaternary, and everything goes up, so our shoreline markers move up, 
But if we would do it perfectly, we should put all that mass that we have removed back into somewhere along the Pyrenees or the or the margins, because they have been eroded from there. But since we don't know the the original distribution, there is no way to do it. Not even with models, you can. Um, you mean the, oh, the, the ones during the Mycenaean? Yeah, but that's a different thing because during the Mycenaean, in terms in the large scale, the erosion that you have is is not so dramatic. It will not have a big isostatic uh, impact in general. Uh, it, most of, for instance, the halite layer is mostly pure. It contains a, a small percentage of plastics. So that the, the Mycenaean, the salinity crisis is only six hundred thousand years in duration. So you don't have, and the drawdown is, we don't agree. So the, the, the community is completely divided on how long that does it last. But uh, it's certainly much shorter than these 600,000 years. So it's a very short period in terms of landscape evolution at the scales that uh, we are talking about, is uh, the, the scale of the entire Mediterranean. Sorry, okay. my, my answer might be a bit confusing, but. Let me give an example. Like when I did some experiments, for instance, to, to see what would be the effect of um, lowering the sea level in the Western Mediterranean and then allowing rivers to retrogressively erode and capture the continents next to. This was in the Ebro margin in Eastern Spain. And, and I was modeling the entire uh, Ebro basin story. And adding or not adding this drawdown that lasts for only a few tens of thousands of years, or maybe two, three hundred thousand years, changes nothing in the landscape evolution of the of the entire Ebro Basin scale. Too short. Okay, thank you. Uh Okay, before I give it to uh, to Jan, uh, may I ask a typical question by a sequence historiographer? Uh, and <clears throat> I admit that um, much of my question actually is uh, is based on on my ignorance of of the regional geology of the Mediterranean. But other than uh, the uh, Paleo Valleys, are there other um, signs of low stand uh, of the sea level low stand during the desiccation? Such as uh, low stand shorelines and, and low stand deltas or forced regressive deltas around much of the Mediterranean. Yeah, I did not have time to to show, uh, but there is this um, there is a, a fantastic paper in geology about three years ago. What the first author is made of, I think made of, and um, they show um, they show beautiful. Um, Patterns of, of uh, that are just on top atop the halite layer mm -hmm. and of distributed uh, delta systems uh, that that with even the the, the you can distinguish uh, the lateral next to the to what was the, the water flow you can see the dikes next to ne the positional dikes next to, next to it in in uh, very much with a lot of detail really very interesting I can pass you the the article. Oh. Um, but these have been also questioned by some people because they say the same features you could explain sub, I, submarine, mm. as submarine features, by turbidite uh, delivery of uh, mm -hmm. transport to the abyssal areas. That's, I think this is the, the most difficult uh, aspect of the erosion of features is how to Distinguish them, how to tell whether they are subaerial or submarine, and it's less trivial than than it seems. Okay, maybe one last question from Jan. Yeah. We need it for the uh, for the people online. Okay, I would like to ask uh, if, for example, the ref flooding of the Mediterranean uh, had uh, somehow affected the global eustasy, and if, for example, in other delta systems, uh, some progradation or subaerial erosion can be seen or something. 
if some progradation in uh, the other deltas like yeah. i mean uh, connected to the uh, global oh. uh, global oceans and the eustasy of global eustasy if like the raffling of the yeah. mediterranean has affected the the sea level in the world ocean yeah um actually there is a, a very neglected paper that is describing exactly this they in they, they have an atoll in the pacific ocean where they see at the at the end of the Mycenaean salinity crisis or the, the dates at the time were not very well fixed because that was the before the, the the final datings of the Mycenaean deposits so what we now know that it should be around 5.3 million years ago this is when the Mediterranean recovers normal conditions they find in an atoll in the Pacific Ocean uh, some signal in the seismic stratigraphy suggesting a lowering of the um, uh, global ocean of about 30 meters. I think this, they say 30 meters, uh, but actually the one you would expect from the desiccated the Mediterranean to the levels that we think it was desiccated should be less than that, should be about in the order of 10 meters. So 10 meters, answering your, your question, 10 meters is the amount of global sea level drop that allows you to refill um, a Mediterranean that would be around 1.5, around 1.5 kilometers if below sea level, present sea level. Yep. All right, and there's a question from John again. Thanks, David. This is a really silly one. You, you <laughs> showed a plot Loger's plot of drainage area and nick point speed. Yeah. Ah. Right. Now, like you said, that's it's a mystery about how long we had the drawdown. There's not not uh, agreement. I can't remember if I asked you this before, but anyway, I wonder if um, because the the nick point speed is scaled to drainage area, that means that only the big rivers can push a nick point above the high stand in the time that they've got. The small rivers won't be able to because their drainage areas are too small, the nick points will be too slow. And if you could use that as a threshold to, to, to back calculate the time of the low stand. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. I think you could actually draw a sketch to illustrate your question. I mean, for the students of the audience uh -huh. probably are getting lost. Okay, yeah, sure, I'll try. That, that's going to be fun. Because, because all of a sudden we have switched from a sedimentary geology and paleontology seminar to a geomorphology uh -huh. one. So, here. Yeah, there's a relationship between these two, and it's it's log log, right? Now, this means that only big catchments, catchments beyond a certain uh, drainage area or discharge, are able to get their nick points above the position of the high stand when the when the Mediterranean refills. And the smaller catchments don't. And we can see that because only the big rivers have paleo valleys. The small rivers don't because yeah. the, the nick point can't get, the nick point is flooded. Yeah, but how do you say you would estimate the duration of the drawdown based on this? Well, because, well, I think Greg could do it. We would have to make assumptions about this speed you know what I'm saying, Greg? Is it crap? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because there Based should be a threshold. One. This. Um, yes, using maybe. Uh, these are the authors that have studied this the most. I haven't, I don't remember I have seen anything like that. By doing it 
by modeling, by, by landscape evolution modeling, um, you end up you too, with many, too many unknowns in the, in the parameters. So you, the, those models have no predictive value. So I have seen like these authors and also Gargani and, and myself, we have been doing models that simulate this up, upstream propagation of erosion along the main rivers. But uh, we have no predictability in the sense that we cannot use those models to, to decide how long does it last. And the reason is because the erosion parameters, essentially erodability and the powers in the stream power law, they are too unknown. You, you, there, you don't even have a, a, a two orders of magnitude range that you can at, attach to. And from that, make some assumptions on the duration, you see? So, yeah. Okay. Thank you, guys. <laughs> you, do you agree with this? Well, agree with um, this, this, is a, this was an unexpected excursion into quantitative geomorphology uh, by some of our friends, uh, including Martin Margold uh, over there from, uh, uh, from uh, the Department of um, Physical Geography and Geoecology. And uh, let me just tell you that if you want to understand that this, which is cutting edge uh, geomorphological science, uh, you are, uh, I, I'm sure you will be very welcome at uh, lectures uh, in uh, at the Department of Physical Geography. But, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry for um, interrupting that uh, bit of the discussion. Uh, we now have about 10 minutes to vacate the room. So let's uh, have a last question, if there is anybody to, to ask one. And if not, we can always continue the, uh, the discussions in a less formal manner, I think. Uh, Martin Koschak is taking us to a, uh, a restaurant facility somewhere in and uh, Ukarla, I guess. And 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 uh, do you was there a question to? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Uh, thank you very much. We'll we'll certainly. Uh, consider that option and uh, with that I would like to uh, thank you all for coming and above all let me thank to Daniel for his uh, great talk uh, very thought-provoking informative and also amusing so if uh, if you uh, want, you have, uh, I think, on our website of the uh, Institute of Geophysics, you can find Daniel's uh, email address, so you can, you can ask him if, if any further questions arise later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.